So welcome everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, this is our pre-Passover um, class. Um, and uh, I would have had this next Thursday, but we're on the day before Passover, we have a lot of synagogue events all day. And so we're, we're not gonna be having a class. Um, but today we're gonna, we're, it's a standalone class. Um, and we're gonna be looking and discussing um, the story of Moses and the Torah. And it, it always is uh, just so mysterious and, and interesting that when we read the Haggadah and we read through the story of every year of Passover of the Jews leaving Egypt, Moses is nowhere to be found. Um, and in the story itself, Moses is the main protagonist. He's the one who, who is the, whose story uh, carries um, in some way the whole narrative. And he then becomes the, the main um, protagonist, human protagonist of the rest of the Torah as well. Um, and so uh, we're going to kind of, we're going to be looking at the hidden Moses and who was Moses and did he really look like Charles, Charlton Hessen? But I don't know if we can answer that question in this class. Uh, but uh, uh, but we're, we're going to be uh, discussing and looking at the stories and certain aspects of the stories that I find interesting and um, and and see what, what's the lesson through all of it. Um, so let us begin. We're going to, I'm going to share my screen and take us to, uh, to Moses. So I've entitled this class, Faith and Courage, Moses's Story in the Torah. Now, if I were to ask you, what when you think of Moses and his his one quality. What's what's Moses's one quality that you associate with him? I would say humble. Humble, right? The most humble man in the whole world, as the Torah says. Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah, uh, I would say courage. Courage. Yeah, yeah, courage. Courage. And he uh, he. He doesn't uh, like injustice. Hmm. Beautiful. Stand up for justice. Anyone else? Moses, when you think of Moses, I just, for any of you who are coming to our second night Seder, whether in person or virtual, we're going to be have, we're going to be, uh, showing some clips from the Ten Commandments. Um, and I was just watching the burning bush scene from the Ten Commandments. Um, what, a, what a powerful scene that actually is. I, I, I forget because the movie, the movie goes a little bit downhill after Moses leaves Egypt and arrives in Midian. But actually that's, in my opinion, but the, the, it's a very powerful, the scene of the burning bush. Um, he may be, he's, well, as has been said, you know, he's shown to be humble, he's shown to be courageous, he's also human, hmm. he, he has a temper, he's, he lashes out, mm -hmm. um, and that lashing out sometimes has consequence, or, you know, does have consequences. Wonderful. I always felt that this wasn't something Moses really wanted to do. He kind of he kind of stumbled into it and then found his footing that uh, he would have preferred to have stayed, uh, watched the sheep. Um, he, he really, you know, when God came to him, it's not something he he really wanted to do. Are you sure you want me? Don't you want somebody else? Mm -hmm. um, until he finally found his footing and, and found the real Moses as to what he wanted to do. Hmm. Beautiful. Thank and you. I, know, I know it's 40 years later, but it, it's very, um, it's very overwhelming to me to think that Moses never made it into the promised land. Hmm. It, it really, it really is. It's a really, it, it's not a, it's not a happy ending that, that are, you know, fiction stories uh, have or the Hollywood has, you know, there's, it's, uh, that was not, that was not a comment on the story itself, but on 
the stories that we usually read or or watch in movies to have happy the happy perfect ending um and this is not um this is not what happens in our in our story for moses um okay so let's begin um uh, i wanted to first take us we, it's a, it is a long story um i i often think about how there are parts of the tour that go on and on and you know the story of bilam the talking donkey is you know uh, almost a whole parsha right um uh, uh bilam and balak um, and the talking donkey um but the story of moses himself is quite short now it is short but it's not that short so we, we are going to be jumping around a little bit um and i first want to take us to the the context of moses's birth right what in what context is moses born into um, and just this one verse, Alan, do you mind reading this one verse from the first chapter of Exodus for us? Sure. Then Pharaoh charged all his people saying, every boy that is born, uh, every, oh, okay. Every boy that is born, you shall throw into the Nile, but let every girl live. Hmm. Let it. Let us try to imagine what was it like among the Israelites after Pharaoh's decree? What were the circumstances of Moses' birth? <clears throat> what do you think? I mean, it's... <clears throat> does, doesn't make you want to have children, probably, right? Um, I mean, that's probably the intended consequence. We have that... We have the midrash, um, uh, you know, that uh, of the where the Israelite women trying to um, lure the the Jewish men to having babies because the Jew the, the fathers just they want to take the chance anymore. You know what? It's not uh, you know what what do you do? You know with with such, with such a decree, it's a very very uh, a fear provoking. You know, hard, hard for us to put ourselves in, in those shoes. Um, anybody else have any thoughts on you know, what would it have been like to be a slave and to hear of Pharaoh's decree? You know, it's just it's one more, one more injustice, one more cruel cruel decree from a uh, from the pharaoh mm -hmm. yeah one, one more cruel one, one to talk you know really taking away um taking away our continuity right and i mean i think we read this and often as and as jewish people we think of this is not the only time this has happened that rulers have tried to take away jewish continuity and destroy the jewish people right and whether it's taking away our religious freedom or just killing or trying to uh, kill us or prevent here, prevent us from having children. Um, and, you know, what's, what, 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 what do you do with that? And it's happened, you know, if we think of the Roman, the, the, the decrees um, of the Romans that forbid circumcision, that forgive, forbid the studying of Torah, we think of, you know, the Nazis in the second world war um, and, um, what a, you know the you know what 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 does it take as a Jewish person living at this time to 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 actually go ahead and decide to have to have children you know that's I think it uh, just shows you know how courageous uh, both the women and the men were uh, you know because you know and obviously and they must must have had faith in God that. Um, you know that they would ultimately survive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it takes a take a lot of faith to to put yourself through through um, through having children when you know Pharaoh's um, decree. Um, to go through nine months, to have a mother to go through nine months of pregnancy and then have their son taken away. Yeah, you didn't. You just don't know where. It would make every, every every pregnancy terrifying and really really challenging. 
It also reminds me of China, but in the opposite with the one child policy right. and how many women gave away their daughters. Mm -hmm. You know, if the Egyptians wanted slaves to do work, um, it was kind of counterproductive then to say, we'll kill all the, uh, kill all the boys because at some point they're going to run out of slaves. Hmm. Really, really interesting. It just shows you how, how full they must have been of the Israelite. And, you know, it's not in the Torah, but we have the Midrash that says that, you know, Pharaoh's magicians and astrologers looked up to the skies and said to him, you know, uh, a boy is going to be born who's going to deliver the Jewish people. Um, and so that was what prompted Pharaoh's decree, because he said, you know, mm -hmm. I'm not going to, I'm not going to allow that, I'm not going to allow that to happen. Um, okay. Well, the other, the other thing that uh, it, it shows is that, you know, whatever happens in the world, it's not so much, you know, the, the things that, you know, that, you know, that befall you, let's say, but how you respond to them. That makes a difference. Beautiful. Right. Very, Victor Frankel, right? That's yes. the, <laughs> right. The, um, you know, as, as you were, as Gary, as you were asking your question, I was thinking about uh, in how self-destructive it was, but for the Nazis too, right? They say it was self-destructive in the Second World War. They poured in all their resources to killing Jews instead of waging the war at certain points, and it was self-destructive, but that's how powerful their hate was. Um, and maybe for Pharaoh too, his hate was so powerful, he was killing his very his, his slaves. You know, that doesn't seem, um, but that, that, that power of hate and of evil um, even leads people to do things that are against their own, their own best interest. Um, so let, let's go to uh, the courage, right, of a certain member of the house of Levi. Um, Alan, go ahead, read for us uh, one more little passage. A certain member of the house of Levi went and took into his household as his wife, a woman of Levi. The woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw how beautiful or goodly he was, she hid him for three months. And then go ahead with Rashi's. Okay, Rashi's commentary. How beautiful he was. When he was born, the whole house became filled with light. What was this light? What does it mean for a person to have light with them? When do we see people with light? What does it convey? Why did the Israelites and Moses's parents continue to have children despite the decree? Um, and, and, and maybe just to uh, make Rashi's comment more explicit, um, the word in the Hebrew is tov, when she saw how goodly, it said beautiful is our translation, but goodly, and that takes us back to the creation story, right? God <laughs> saw the light, you know, saw that they made the light and saw that it was good. It was tov, right? So um, that's that association. So what, what was this light? What was... Um... I don't think of it as a literal light. Mm -hmm. Although, you know, in a lot of, I guess, art, famous pieces of art, people have light emanating. But, you know, when you think about a, a newborn baby, and the the light the light that it brings to the parents to the family how bright and you know everybody is how cheerful everybody is um you know a, a baby brings a very special feeling to people beautiful it, it lifts everybody up yeah and i could you know, even though it was a male child, I could still see at this time, you know, the, the parents being filled with joy from having having a baby. Yeah. Aaron must have been born before the decree. Yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. it's, it's interesting, this depiction of light, right? We find it across cultures, you know, and across um you know uh this depiction of, of light um 
Anybody else want to comment on the lights? Have you ever had uh, the experience of feeling that there was, you know, there's a newborn light or are there other circumstances where you feel that there is light, so to speak? I mean, it's a very big, very big topic in Judaism, too, because of that light. Talking about the light of creation, it's, it's a big theme within Drash and within mysticism, obviously, in Kabbalah, but also uh, any other time where you, you've seen somebody, a loved one, so you, have, you, you look light-filled or you have a lot of light with you or anybody ever um, felt that or seen that? Oh, Nancy. Hello, everybody. Sorry I'm late. No problem. Um, Um, okay, well, we'll move on. Um, you know, I think that the, the, this light, this idea of light in Moses' life continues throughout his whole story, right? We have the light that shines later when he comes back down off the mountain of Mount Sinai, and the light is too bright, and the people say, you know, put a, put a, put a cover over your face. We can't bear the light in your face. Um, and uh, in, the, you know, in the Ten Commandments, when Moses comes down, from the, the from the burning bush, um, uh, Joshua is there in the in, not in the Torah, but in that story. And there is and there is Zipporah, and they look at his face and they know something has happened. You know, he's not just he's not just strolling down. Like, hey, I met God. You know, he's he's awestruck, right? Um, and so they think they know something's happened. Um, and uh, you know this this. We see this in, the, in, in paintings often, as, as, as Alan was saying, right? You convey the inner light of a person, right? The, I think Rembrandt did a beautiful job of that, they say, right? Rembrandt, when you see Rembrandt paintings, um, he conveyed kind of like the light coming from a person's face in a very powerful and moving way. Um, the paintings of Jesus, so they all have uh, light on top of his head. Mm -hmm. but Jesus has light and Right, the Christian, the Catholic saints all have halos, yeah. um, but also in the East, Horror, yeah. in Buddhist and Hindu traditions, they all have halos around their heads, you know, conveying of having light coming from their heads. Um, it's a common kind of religious theme and idea. Um, but, uh, you know, even uh, in, in Jewish thought too, uh, here, I, I just happened to, I have this book, which was a book that I used to uh, study Kohelet. Uh, but here, it's, it's the light of the Ben Ish Chai, right? Uh, the Ben Ish Chai was a um, Mizrahi, uh, fairly modern saint, or, but it's the light of the Ben Ish Chai. What's the light of the Ben Ish Chai, right? It's the light. So this idea of light is very common across religious traditions as conveying um, the humanity, the holiness, um, and so Moses has that from the beginning, right? He's born out of an act of faith, not of an act of courage, to have children despite the decree. Um, mm -hmm. And his, his, pair, his, his parents hide him. I mean, maybe all parents at that point tried to hide their, their sons, but um, they really, they're, they, the whole family could die, right? Well, we can, it doesn't say that, but it's implicit, right? What would happen if the Egyptians found that they were hiding their son? We don't, we don't know, but we maybe we can imagine that they would all be punished. And again, my mind goes to Viktor Frankl and all the stories of the concentration camps where, you know, if you did anything that was, you know, against the guards decree, that was it, you're, you're a goner, right? And that was, it was understood. Um, okay, um, Exodus to someone else. Uh, we're moving. Had what she what she decides to do. Nancy, would you like to read for us Exodus two, three to four? Um, from the screen or from my text? Um, from the screen would be would be good. Okay. But if you, all right, you... Exodus two verses three through four. When she could hide him no longer, she got a wicker basket, literally a wicker ark, for him and caulked it with bitumen and pitch. She put the child into it and placed, among, placed it among the reeds by the bank of the Nile. Uh, the commentary also? Um, that's my question I put there, but I'm um, sure. And his sister stationed herself at a distance 
to learn what would befall him. Thank you. So Moses is hid right in an ark. The word for the basket is also the ark, the same word as Moses, as Noah's ark. Hmm. And, and even the materials used to create it are also the same. Um, I would, if we had more time, I would go back to the story of Noah to show you that. Um, Noah. What, so what, what, what's, what's the connection between this ark and Noah's ark? How are they similar? Different. They're, they're both vessels of salvation. Steve, they're go ahead. They're both vessels They saved the, save the people with time. Sorry, and saved Moses. Okay, they saved, they saved the people. What did you say before? They both were what, des desperate, did you say? <laughs> Well, the boats uh, are a symbol of salvation. They pr protected salvation. you at the time. Yeah, they're both they're both symbols of salvation, right? The Noah carries the salvation of humanity, and um, this ark carries the salvation of the Jewish people, and maybe of humanity too, right? Uh, because the law comes out of it, and the idea of God's holiness coming in, and in our tradition, that's what will lead to the salvation of the full salvation, right? Uh, we talk about how. Um, M Moses is the uh, is the first geula, the first redemption, but the geula shlema, the full redemption, you know, is this is just the first step in the full redemption that will happen at the end of days when peace will come to the whole world. Um, anybody else? You, just for more, what it was like with uh, going and walking into Noah's ark and putting Moses into this ark. An act of, go ahead, Nancy, you're about to say something. I was, what I was going to point out was Moses is the only occupant of this particular ark, right? So, yeah. so if we're comparing it to Noah's ark, which included what, eight people and then two of each animal and insect on the entire planet, right? I mean, the, yeah, yeah, the, yeah. the magnitude of Noah's Ark and what it is, you know, saving humanity, as you said, but, but to put all of your eggs in one basket, I mean, to put just one egg in one basket, that's a huge, huge risk, right? That's a huge leap of faith. Not that Noah's wasn't a, a leap of faith, um, but I'm seeing, I'm seeing this tiny little basket, right? That's, that's, holding yeah. one baby on the mm -hmm. second largest river in the world, right? It, it, it's, mm -hmm. it's overwhelming. Well, that one egg is gonna be saving a lot of people in the end. Right, right. But the danger to what I'm looking at. But at the time it's done, uh, his mother doesn't know that she's saving her child. Right. The, she's doing uh, what she has to do, right? right? She's doing what she has to do. With with, with a, a lot of there's a lot of uncertainty in both, maybe even more here. But you know, Noah walks into the ark. I mean, God told him to build this ark, but you know, he has he doesn't know what, what is going to happen as the waters rise, and they're both they're both they're both desperate acts too, um, um, and uh, taking. I mean, it takes a lot of faith to send your son um, in uh, in a basket into the Nile, right? You know, sending away. I mean, as a parent, I can't imagine doing that. You know, the second the second my son, which he likes to run away sometimes, and second I see him running away, you know, suddenly I have eagle's wings and I'm running as fast as I can to grab him, make sure he's not walking onto the road, you know? So to think of doing that is just an incredible uh unimaginable um his sister goes after him but it's still a really uh, very very scary i mean well, what's 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 the other thing they could have done right so the, the way that. exactly so the the way the way the 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 commentaries take it is you know when he he, he was so full of light um that the whole house was full of light and he was so loud and so vital that his cries and they just couldn't hide him anymore because they were worried that, you know, people could hear it and the Egyptians would have heard him. And so they had to do this, you know, why didn't they hide it after three months? You know, so that was, um, 
This was their only choice. So I'm going to skip through that little passage where he grows up in the palace, but we know he grows up and, you know, he gets rescued by Bat Paro, the daughter of Pharaoh. He grows up in the palace, but being nursed at first by his mother. Um, but he, he grows up as an Egyptian, and I think <clears throat> the movies convey this um, very well. The Torah doesn't tell us much about it. But then we have this enigmatic sometime after that, right? Whenever Torah wants to start to tell us something powerful and important, it says sometime after that, you know, um, uh, one day, by Yomahu, on that day, um, this is a reoccurring theme in all of our, in all the Bible. On that day, um, you know, something will happen or something happened. Uh, and so here we go. Sometime, uh, Nancy, go ahead, read this one too, please. Sometime after that, when Moses had grown up, he went out to his kinfolk and witnessed their labors. So he knows that he's Jewish. I've always wondered that. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his kinsmen. He turned this way and that and seeing no one about, he struck down the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. Yeah. It's a good question. How would he know they were his kinsmen? Mm. So it's we're, we're, we're all shaped by the Ten Commandments where he does not know. And that's one of the big tensions of the movie. Um, but, but as we see in the text itself, he seems to know, right? Maybe, yeah, he, he, maybe he was always known. Maybe he, it, was, it was always known. Um, um, but he was he always knew he was a Hebrew, but he grew up in the palace. But he obviously decided at a certain point that what he what he wanted to do. He wanted to discover who he was, right? face who he was. But why did Moses do it? Go ahead. Pharaoh's yeah. daughter knows when she pulls him out of the river that he must be a Hebrew child. I mean, mm -hmm. she says that, right? So perhaps the assumption was, we pulled you out of the river. And so, and maybe, maybe, maybe you were abandoned because you were a Hebrew child. I mean, that's, it, that's kind of implied in the text. Well, he, he might also have been circumcised. I would assume that he was. And mm -hmm. to know that he was Jewish, all he had to do was sort of look down. Mm. <laughs> yeah, maybe that was it. But he, we know that his mother, I, I don't know if you skipped, I guess you did. Um, his mother was brought in uh, to, ingeniously to be his uh, wet nurse, that sure. is, his nurse, right? And it says in the in the story, in the uh, in, Verses uh, like uh, 10, 11, 10, 9, 10, uh, that she took the child and nursed it. And then when he grew up, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter. So, you know, <laughs> she had time to uh, teach him who he was or indoctrinate him or yeah. Ex yeah. explain the situation to him. That's in the story, really. But we don't usually stress that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, maybe we do stress it, and I you know, don't notice it, but it's it's there. Uh, as I said, it does, the the Ten Commandments chose to go a different way, but uh, the movie right, where they hide. But it's as you said, it's very plain in the in the text itself. It's straightforward that he grows. He he's nursed by his very mother, right? His sister, when his sister speaks to Pharaoh's daughter when she meets him, um, when when she finds him. And she proposes to have his mother nurse him. So he grows up with his mother, and then he grows up in the palace. But still, why, why, why do, why does Moses go back? What do you think of Moses's act? What do you think of his action to go out and see his his kinsfolk? Well, one thing before that, uh, yeah. we never talk about Pharaoh's daughter. If Pharaoh's daughter had said, "There's a decree out. I don't want anything to do with this kid," right? right. You know, Pharaoh's daughter saved Moses. Yeah. That was also an act of courage, right? Yeah. She goes against her 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 dad. She goes against her father. Yeah. And so we see we see the Moses, you know, he may be a prince of Egypt. But he, he, he still thinks twice before killing an Egyptian, right? This is not something that one can do even as a rule, of, even as the adopted son of Pharaoh's daughter, right? You can't do that. 
um, um, he looks one way, looks that, right? Presumably to see um, what the Egyptian, you know, if there's anybody about. Our commentaries have all kinds of ideas. He looks this way and that, and he had prophecy and could tell, you know, that this Egyptian was thoroughly bad. Um, but wh why does he do it? Why does he strike the Egyptian? <clears throat> It's it's part of an initiation ceremony too in lots of traditions that the young prince has to kill something, sometimes an animal, most of the time an animal, sometimes uh, an enemy. Uh, there has to be a death. He has to be responsible for killing somebody. Hmm. Well, he's it it is it's a moment that will change his whole life, right? That's for sure. Um, it's a moment that changes him. So he strikes down. Obviously, we talked about this before. He's moved by the injustice, right? There's an injustice. Mm -hmm. he, he has the courage to identify himself with these slaves, which took a lot of courage. We, we don't think about that, but he could have easily spurned where he came from and said, said, I'm an Egyptian. You know, I'm not, I don't want to. Why does he choose to be part of this oppressed people? I mean, that's a, that takes a lot of, that takes a lot of inner strength for a young man as we presume he's not that young but we it takes a lot of strength and you know most people would have looked you know okay i came from the hebrews but i'm no longer a hebrew or you know sided with the egyptians to some level but he this he in that moment is moved to action in a very powerful and potentially self-destructive way right he is it's the same thing as having a child i mean he's he, he just goes there, I mean, and he's moved, he's angry, but he's not that angry because he looks this way and that way, right? That's, if he was just angry, you know, when you're angry, you don't look this way and that way, you just move and do it. But he is, a, he is somewhat calculating, right? He wants to make sure that he's somewhat safe. So it's, calcu it's a calculated move. He looks this way, he looks that way, and then he strikes, um, and he, he, he defends the Hebrew, um, he doesn't defend the Egyptian, the soldier of his adopted people. He defends the Hebrew. Um, and we know how dangerous it is because of what comes afterwards. Um, someone I please. What, I get one of the unanswered questions mm -hmm. is what if there would have been somebody around? Yeah. Yeah. Would he have still struck out and killed the Egyptian? And if he wouldn't have, how different our history may have been. Yeah. It's, uh, I mean, one of the powerful things of this whole story that conveys um, through very short verses is there's something moving within Moses, right? We talked to, uh, you know, uh, David spoke about an initiation, but you really get the sense that there's something that's awakened within him and that's moving him to act and he's not fully in control of whatever that is right it's he, he has some control because he looks this way and that but he might have still struck even if he'd seen someone or if he hadn't done it that day maybe another day he would have struck down an egyptian i mean he's there's something moving within him that he's has trouble controlling something is awakened within him a a vision of justice and inner sense and and he's uh, he has tremendous courage within all of it to keep acting um, just as uh, the, the, all of the, 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 the Jews were moved to have children and to send them, you know, when she sends um, her child away, in my mind, I think about um, also the Holocaust. And I think about, you know, the, the sending the babies over walls, you know, and all kinds of things that happened throughout Jewish history, the amount of faith and courage that Jews have had to have to try and preserve life and the life of their children and, um, you know, through pogroms and all kinds of uh, challenging situations where, um, you know, I spoke about this a few weeks ago in Shul, but, uh, you know, not just Jews, but this is a Jewish story, that Israeli family that was in a cable car crashing in Italy, right? Um, and um, what did, what did, the only survivor of the cable car crash uh, was a, a five-year-old child. And it, he was only saved because his father, as the cable car was crashing, um, hugged and protected the child as it was crashing and that saved the boy. Everybody else died. 
but that that that, that courage for what we do in moments of uh, in terrible moments to um, to save the people we love. Um, but let's uh, let, let's let's move on. Someone read for us chapter two, uh, just a continuation of that story. Morris, do you mind reading for us? Uh, when uh, he went out the next day, he found two Hebrews fighting. So he said to the offender, why do you strike your fellow? He retorted, who made you chief and ruler over us? You mean to kill me as you kill the Egyptian? Moses was frightened and thought, then the matter is known. When Pharaoh learned of the matter, he sought to kill Moses, but Moses fled from Pharaoh. He arrived in the land of Medan and sat down beside a well. Okay. So Moses' courage suddenly turns to fright, right? He's, he's frightened because of Moses, because of Pharaoh. You know, I guess we, we guess that killing an Egyptian taskmaster, even if you are the grandson, the adopted grandson of Pharaoh, is a punishable act. And, and the question that we don't now often ask about this is, why, doesn't, why isn't Moses able right at this moment to deliver his people? Right? Why, why isn't he able to rise up the people? And why, why isn't he become deliverer now? He's not part of the people. He, he still has to establish himself as a Hebrew because right now he's just Pharaoh's daughter's adopted son. He has no status at this point. But but is anybody else troubled by the fact that the that one of the major founders of the faith is a murderer? I mean, that's troubling to me that that he kills this Egyptian. So if we skip over this murder, then we're devaluing the life of the Egyptian. Or if we just accept the murder as a as a necessary step in the Moses narrative in order to attain the next level of being, that's still troubling to me. Why? I, I, so maybe David, you could explain this. Why? Well, you know, it, it, then maybe you should become a Christian because Jesus, <laughs> no, it's very clear. Jesus doesn't kill anybody. Okay. Jesus is a, a totally different kind of cat than Moses. So Moses has within him, something that we all <laughs> recoil when we think about, some of us do, that he, he's a murderer. And, yeah, and, and, we, and, we have to, and we have to somehow integrate that particular act into the whole picture of Moses. Yeah. So he's a much more complicated character than Jesus. So it, it, it's, it's interesting. I was going to say something similar, but from a slightly different angle, which is, you know, our the Jewish tradition is not a completely pacifistic tradition. That is one part of it. I mean, the the Talmud says if you're being pursued, you go you you go after your pursuer. Um, yeah. But that is part of it. But on the other hand, look, Moses, as we were saying earlier, is punished. He does not enter the promised land. And there are those who say that part of that is because of his inability to control his anger. Um, from this, from here, from striking the rock. Moses does, is, has trouble controlling his anger. Mm -hmm. And so even though he's our greatest prophet and the most humble man, he's not a perfect man. Um, and his act, I mean, is it, it, he's saving a life, right? And that's why at that moment, right, where it says he looks this way and that, the commentators, they have a, they say he was looking into the future of the Egyptians' life and saw only evil and sin. Because they're obviously bothered by it too, right? They're looking at, so they're saying, you know, so how that explains it. That makes it okay. <laughs> it, it doesn't make it. Doesn't make it okay to make kill. Okay. So that's a big question. Does it make it okay to kill someone who's killing another person, or what, at what point is are you justified? And I mean, that's a very big question. I mean, was he killing the Jew? Was he just striking him? Um, it, it, it is a big question. It, it does put something over Moses's life. Um, but on the other hand, the, the, the weight of all of the slavery that's imposed on the Jews um, and what the taskmasters were doing to the slaves, um, you know, brings, makes that, you know, he didn't just kill a random Egyptian. This was a slave master who was striking a Jewish slave. Um, and 
uh, maybe killing, you know, it's the, the word, the word in the Hebrew is stronger than strike, right? It's a word that could, with the notes could be striking to kill. Um, so, I don't know, anybody, anybody else have any thoughts on that? Well, to answer your question of why wasn't Moses able to deliver his people yet, he wasn't ready. He wasn't the Moses we know yet. He was still young. Um, he still hadn't had other life experiences. He hadn't gone through the desert. He hadn't uh, gone. To, he hadn't gotten married. He hadn't had kids. He hadn't gone to the. He hadn't uh, seen God at the burning bush. He hadn't been sent back to a different Pharaoh. Um, he um, he wasn't the Moses, the deliverer uh, that he became later. He just wasn't prepared for it yet. He wasn't prepared. He wasn't. He wasn't transformed yet into, right. into, Mo, into the Moses, the Moses that we read about, Moshe Rabbeinu. Um, okay, let's move on because I want to get to the story of the burning bush because I think this is this is that moment, right? This is a moment of transformation. Um, so where he comes to Midian, when he spends forty years, according to tradition, in Midian, um, we have all kinds of beautiful stories of what happens there. Um, you know, he gets trained according to some beliefs by his father-in-law, the high priest of Midian in spiritual matters. One of the most wonderful Midrashim um, stories, uh, obviously from the Middle Ages, is a story that um, where in Midian there was a rock and stuck in the rock uh, was a staff. And nobody could remove the staff from the rock. It was stuck <laughs> in, the stone. until, until, until the, the person who would release the staff would be the chosen one. And that the staff, according to this midrash, was a staff that Adam used in the Garden of Eden um, that he brought with him out of the Garden of Eden. And it was passed down through the patriarchs um, all the way, uh, all the way down. And um, the, the father, the, the, the Jethro, Yitro, um, he knew this tradition and he was going to marry off his daughter, Zipporah, to whoever was able to remove the staff. So nobody had ever been able to remove it. It was lying in some dusty corner of Midian until Moses came and uh, he came and grabbed the staff and lo and behold, it came out of the stone and Jethro knew that he was he was the one who would be his son and deliverer of the people. Um, but I think that the, the Midrash tells us a little bit about what uh, Moses undergoes through this period, right? A period of knowing himself, of, uh, of transformation, of, of finding his power, right? There's what's your staff? Your staff is your power, right? And so Moses finds his spiritual power. Um, and that staff, right, has is what the plagues happen through it and and further on in the story, the staff is really powerful. So um, let's let's read this, this let's read this moment of the burning bush. Um, Morris, would you like to read for us? Yes. Um, now Moses tending the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian, drove the flock into the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. A messenger of the Lord appeared to him in blazing fire out of a bush. He gazed, and there was a bush all aflame, yet the bush was not consumed. Moses said, I must turn aside to look at this marvelous sight. Why doesn't the bush burn up? When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to look, God called to him out of the bush. Moses, Moses, he, he answered. Uh, he answered, here I am. And God said, do not come closer. Remove your sandals from your feet, for the place on which you stand is holy ground. Okay. So we're going to go on a little bit and skip a few, see a few more ver verses. But what, 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 what is so powerful about this moment? You read it; it's a powerful description of a of a divine encounter. What are, what are the elements of it that you, the the mood of, that are moving to us that we find? The the thing that always interested me about that encounter was it see there, there is a sense in which this particular bush appears outside of Moses rather than inside of him. And yet there is, it says here, it says that Moses turned back 
or turned aside to Side. see the great sight. So it's clear it's clear to me that this particular experience was not externalized. This was an internal experience that may maybe has some sort of in external component to it. Anyway, yeah, that's a, that's something that I've thought about for some time with respect to that particular uh, episode. The, the the Lord when the Lord saw that he had turned aside to look. That's a very important moment. So that's a, right. if he had not turned aside to look, then God might not have called out of the bush to him. Well, um, is, does he turn back to look or turn aside to look? I, my sense is he turns back to look because the experience is behind him. Okay, it's an internal experience. It's not a burning bush external to him. It's some internal experience that he's having. So there, 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 there are different way, different commentaries on that, and, and I, I think definitely there is obviously an internal aspect to what's happening. You know, does he hear the voice the way we hear voices? Does he hear it in his head? I mean, that's hard to know. I remember talking with a, a mystic once who said, you know, is anything impossible for God? Um, but uh, on the other hand, uh, you know, he turns aside. In a moral, ethical way, our commentators feel there is something. Moses is not the one who turns aside, right? When he saw his brothers being beaten, he went to look, right? He's never the one who turns aside. He's always the one who has courage to see what is happening. Um, but also he sees something. And now maybe we, we don't all have our eyes open in that way to see the burning bush. What's the burning bush? I mean, we have endless, I'm sure many of you have heard all the different symbolisms, what the burning bush is. Um, I've always thought that the burning bush is just, he saw some kind of light in the burning bush, right? He saw a light in the burning bush and a spiritual light, the light of spiritual experience. And how did he explain it? He saw some kind of fire that wasn't burning up the bush. That's just what it, that's how he, it was described, but he saw a light in the bush and that um, created an experience, right? God was somehow present in that moment in a way they made him take off his, God asked him to take off his sandals because he was on holy ground. He's in a, he's in an altered place, an altered state of being. And he literally encounters, uh, he encounters God. Very powerful, very powerful moment, right? Um, uh, a moment that changes everything uh, for him. Um, and yet, I'm going to move on a little bit fast because I wanted to, I'm going to want to play for us the scene from the Ten Commandments if we're going to have time. <laughs> um, so uh, come, therefore, I will send you to Pharaoh and you shall free my people, the Israelites from Egypt. This is, he says, I am the God of your fathers and all of that. But Moses says to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and free the Israelites from Egypt? Right. It's, we were saying he's reluctant. He doesn't want to do it. But we don't, we're still not there. And God says, I will be with you. That shall be your sign that it was I who sent you. And when you have freed the people from Egypt, you shall worship God at this mountain. Moses says to God, when I come to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your father's house has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is your God's name? What shall I say to them? He still is fishing. He wants, you know, he doesn't want to do this. And God says, hey, I, sure, hey, I am that I am. I will be that I will be. Thus shall you say to the Israelites, hey, hey, I am, send me to you, right? How powerful, the most powerful name for God of any tradition I've ever heard, right? That's pure consciousness. Never, never heard anything more powerful than that. But then Moses still, Moses spoke up and said, but what if they do not believe me and do not listen to me, but say the Lord did not appear to you? So then the Lord says, well, what is that in your hand? He replies, a rod, Right. Um, and that's where he tells him, he reveals three short miracles that we forget about because they're eclipsed by the later miracles. But he says, well, what's that in your hand? And then he says a rod. And then he puts his hand in his, in his vest and it comes out scaly with some kind of leprous disease. But then it's healed. And he reveals three little miracles to show people that he is who he is, signs. But then Moses says again to the Lord, Please, oh my Lord, I have never been a man of words, either in times past or now, that you've spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. What is going on with Moses? Is he, who is he? Is he brave or is he fearful? Is he reluctant? Yes. 
or is he willing? Yes to both. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. How do those coexist within Moses? Because he's human. What does Moses have to find? What does he have to overcome? Himself. <laughs> Himself. His speech impediment. The speech impediment. His self doubt. I mean, what's past of him is pretty big, right? To return to Mo, to return to Egypt. It's a lot that's being asked from him, but he has, he's both very courageous, but he also has self doubt. Barb, go ahead. I was going to say, and Pharaoh raised him, but yet he has to go to Pharaoh and, and try to change his mind. Hmm. The, the, the task is very big. It's easy for us to look back and say, you know, why is he arguing with God? Why is Moses arguing with God? What chutzpah to argue with God three, four times and say, I can't do this when you're being called at a burning bush and encountering the Lord himself, herself. It's, you know, what, what, what chutzpah to do that? Um, but Moses has self-doubt, you know, and he has, he has to overcome. It's a lot is being asked of him. You know, to 80 years old to head back to Egypt and face everything and to um, go through what he'll have to do to deliver his people. Um, but somehow, same thing. Why doesn't Moses deliver the people back when he first strikes the Egyptian? Why isn't he? He's a powerful man. He, why doesn't he go and rise to raise the people up against um, and we see he, he's a complicated, complex person. He has other moments of self-doubt um, or of doubt. Um, he's had a he's, life in Midian. I mean, he's got a wife, he's got children, he's got a job. Yeah, a peaceful life, a yeah. peaceful life. He has a peaceful life and his life is suddenly not going to be quite as peaceful, right? Well, this is going to be serious trouble. <laughs> and uh, I mean, anybody with practical wisdom is going to look at serious trouble and shake his head and think, you know, uh, maybe there's a way I can get out of this somehow. But, you know, uh, what happens is he uh, he accepts the the two sides of this and the two sides being the fear and the courage. He puts them together and uh, he makes a decision. Yeah. He, and he does make his decision. And once he makes that decision. He go. He puts his whole being into it, um, and, and and just to go, I wanted to quickly go over a, other our our tradition of reluctant prophets, right? Mm -hmm. Isaiah yeah. beholds God, um, right, um, in the temple. I'm going to summarize. I don't quite have time. In the year that King Uzziah died, I beheld my Lord seated on a high and lofty throne, and the skirts of his robe filled the temple. He could hear the angels calling, "Holy, holy, holy!" The doorposts start shaking. He's meeting God, and he says, "Woe is me! I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips." See, in my own eyes to beheld the King, Lord of hosts. He doesn't say, "Oh God, I'm ready for your message." He's like, "I'm lost. I can't take this." But then one of the seraphs comes and touches his lips and say, now that this has touched your lips, your guilt shall depart and your sin be purged away. He is made worthy, right? And Jeremiah, God turns to him, before I created you in the womb, I selected you. Before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet concerning the nations. And I replied, "Ah, oh Lord God, I don't know how to speak for I'm still a boy. And the Lord said to me, do not say I'm still a boy, but go wherever I send you and speak whatever I command you, have no fear of them, for I am with you to deliver you, declares the word. And the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, herewith I put my words into your mouth. Um, and so we have, right, the rest of his calling. We have this tradition of what it means to be a person who follows a path of faith, a path of holiness, a path of, 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 of following, of bringing deliverance and justice. And um, it's presented in, in a complex way, both of tremendous faith and tremendous courage, um, um, and, but also um, of, of, of how challenging and difficult that is. But it's all rooted around the experience, right? It's all coming out of an experience of the divine. It's the experience of the divine that gives the power and the faith. 
And that's the essence of the Passover Seder. It's the, ex the experience of the Passover Seder is what get, which is supposed to lead us to an experience of the divine is what is supposed to give us the courage to pursue justice um, in our world. It's the experience of God that's supposed to give us um, the, the, the internal faith to do what is um, seemingly impossible. So I'm going to just play very quickly because I think the Ten Commandments uh, does portray it very compellingly. Um, and here we go very quickly. All right. Here. Put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place where I now stands is holy ground. I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Lord, Lord, why do you not hear the cries of their children in the bondage of Egypt? I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt, and I have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. Therefore, I will send thee. Bring my people out of Egypt. Who am I, Lord, that you should send me? How can I lead this people out of bondage? What words can I speak that they will heed? I will teach thee what thou wilt say. When thou hast brought forth the people, they shall serve me upon this mountain. I will put laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them. Now, therefore, go, and I will be with thee. But if I say to your children that the God of their fathers has sent me, they will ask, what is his name? And how shall I answer them? I am that I am. Thou shalt say, I am hath sent me unto you. Is the holy mountain forbidden to men? Yes, and I am afraid for him. Then he is more than man. Well, look. <laughs> Your hairdo. Look at his face. He has seen God. Moses, your hair, your sandals. 
I stood upon holy ground. Can you tell us, Moses? My eyes could not look upon him. Did he speak? He revealed his word to my mind. And the word was God. Did he speak as a man? He is not flesh, but spirit. The light of eternal mind. And I know that his light is in every man. Did he ask something of you? Yeah. That I go to Egypt. You are God's messenger. Yes. I want to write the Quite beautiful. Both beautiful and corny at the same time, right? But uh, uh <laughs> no, I'm sorry. I watch the movie every year when it's on because I can't help it. And it, to me, it's like watching a train wreck. Yeah. <laughs> My kids and I watch Prince of Egypt too. <laughs> Prince of Egypt is good too. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's uh, more modern, obviously, but there's good something music. special about this one. Yeah, music is great. Anyway, um, thank you, everyone. Uh, oh, well, did you answer the question why Moses isn't in the Haggadah? <laughs> so why Moses isn't in the Haggadah? I didn't. That was didn't, the that was what was advertised. That is true. So why is Moses not in the Haggadah? Um, come to the second night seder, and maybe I'll I'll have an answer. <laughs>